Today we'll be focusing on the uh, second stage of the judicial review, which is the substantive uh, motion. Uh, this stage arises after leave has been granted, uh, and the court would have to hear what is known sometimes as the judicial review proper, or the substantive motion. Right, so I thought I'd start by giving you a bit of an overview as to how the substantive motion uh, in a judicial review is conducted. Um, first of all, uh, the rules require that the hearing of the substantive motion uh, be done in open court. Uh, but of, co of course, in today's uh, conditions, that will be uh, by way of a virtual hearing uh, most of the times. Um, but the lawyer's counsel would be um, required to um, be garbed in the open court attire. This is unlike the uh, leave stage, which the rules require to be done in chambers. Uh, the other important thing to note about how the substantive hearing is conducted is that it will be largely based on the established grounds of challenge in a judicial review, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the Diplockian heads uh, of challenge, because it's named after Lord Diplock, who um, many have regarded to have established these grounds of challenge. They are set out in the second bullet point, uh, illegality, irrationality, procedural impropriety, and proportionality. Uh, these principles will animate uh, most of the arguments at the substantive stage. I will speak about these grounds of challenge a little later on uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, but the other point to note uh, at the outset uh, about how the hearing is conducted is that the evidence will, broadly speaking, um, on 99% of the times, be conducted uh, by way of affidavit evidence. And it is really only in very exceptional circumstances that the court will allow for evidence to be led by way of cross-examination the cross-examination of a deponent. Um, and in fact, the reported cases show that this has only been allowed on two occasions in the past. So it is in very exceptional circumstances that the court will actually allow for uh, evidence to be led by way of cross-examination. Right. I'll speak ab about cross-examination in judicial review a little later on. Now, the first thing that the applicant uh, would have to do uh, after leave has been granted, is to prepare what is known as the notice of hearing uh, form. Uh, this form uh, uh, essentially states two things. Uh, first, it will state when uh, leave was granted. And secondly, it would state the uh, return date or the next date for the substantive motion. So it will say, for instance, the substantive motion of this, of this judicial review uh, will be fixed for case management before this particular person on a particular date. The uh, notice of hearing form would have to take the uh, format prescribed in uh, Form 110, which is the form annexed to the uh, rules of court. Uh, and more importantly, uh, Order 53 Rule 4 requires that the notice of hearing be filed uh, no later than uh, 14 days after uh, leave has been granted. Now, after the notice of hearing is uh, filed, the court would uh, produce the sealed copy of the notice of hearing. Now, um, after that is obtained, the applicant would have to serve the sealed uh, notice of hearing as well as the Order 53 statement, which is one of the pleadings I spoke about in the first part, and all affidavits filed in support of the judicial review on all persons directly affected by the application no later than 14 days before the hearing date of the uh, judicial review. Now, what does uh, all persons directly affected mean? To whom uh, do these papers need to be served? Now, naturally, that would require, that phrase would require service on all the named respondents to the judicial review. But the courts have interpreted the term directly affected under Rule 4 in a broad manner to also require, on occasion, service of these papers on third parties that have not been named in the judicial review. But these third parties would have to show themselves to be uh, persons who are directly affected, have a direct interest, or, or would be adversely affected by the judicial review. So just to give an example, uh, the case that has been cited in the third bullet point of the slides, uh, the Court of Appeal decision of Advanced Energy Capital, in that case, a private company that wasn't named in the, in the judicial review was allowed to intervene in the action and have the papers served upon it because the court saw that that private company was directly affected or had a direct interest in the judicial review. In that case, the judicial review was a challenge against uh, a decision of the Minister of Finance. 
to approve a, part, a, a transaction that involved this private company that hadn't been named. And uh, because the Court of Appeal saw this private company to be a party directly affected by the outcome of the judicial review, it number one, allowed the private company to intervene into the action, even though it was not named. And number two, it required that the papers, the notice of hearing, order 53 statement, and the affidavits filed in support to be served upon this private company. I'll speak a bit more about intervention of third parties in a judicial review later, later on, but for present purposes, uh, it would be good to bear in mind that the term directly affected, insofar as Rule 4 is concerned, has been interpreted to require not only service on the named respondents to the action, but it also requires service on third parties who haven't been named, but who show themselves to be uh, to have a direct interest or would be directly affected by the judicial review. Now, the next part is on the orders of discovery uh, that are available in a judicial review. Um, now, after leave has been granted, uh, Rule 6 uh, allows or provides for the disposal of both the um, applicant and the respondent to the action three forms of interlocutory applications that could be used to enable one party to obtain further evidence from the other. And uh, these are forms of uh, um, applications of discovery. There are three forms. Um, one is an application uh, for discovery of documents. Uh, secondly, an application to administer interrogatories. And thirdly, an application for leave to cross-examine a deponent of an affidavit filed uh, in a judicial review. But generally speaking, it's important to bear in mind uh, generally speaking, such applications are not often granted by the courts. Uh, this is because uh, in judicial review cases, uh, judicial review cases rarely turn on questions of fact for which orders of discovery are often seen to be necessary. Ordinarily, a, a judicial review would be premised principally on matters of law. Uh, and that is why the courts, you'll see uh, uh, shortly, have set a fairly high threshold to meet when one seeks to obtain um, uh, um, or uh, seeks to be granted an order of discovery to obtain further evidence from another party. Now, I'll speak first about the first type of uh, discovery that is available, and that is the an application for the discovery of documents uh, in a judicial review. The Court of Appeal in the RECA Pacific uh, case set out the elements that uh, would apply in determining whether uh, discovery should be granted. They are set out in the slides, so discovery would be ordered where it is seen to be necessary for the fair disposal of a matter and to ensure that the uh, justice of the matter is advanced. Uh, discovery would also be awarded uh, or ordered where it is necessary to determine if the contents of the affidavits are uh, uh, accurate or if there is evidence to suggest that there are some inaccuracies in, the, in what is stated in the affidavit and an order of discovery would um, aid the court in determining whether um, uh, what is said on the affidavit is accurate or otherwise. Uh, and finally, the Court of Appeal um, uh, in Record Pacific also expressly said that discovery wouldn't be ordered so as to make good any defects in the applicant's evidence. So in Record Pacific, that was a judicial review challenge against the delisting of a public uh, company. And uh, the applicant there filed an application for discovery to obtain further documents to support that challenge. Uh, but the Court of Appeal refused that application because it took the view that the applicant already had uh, in his possession adequate material, adequate documents to support his challenge uh, in that case. And so that was why the discovery was refused, as it was seen to be uh, unnecessary for the uh, fair and just disposal uh, of the case. The second form of discovery that is available is uh, the opportunity for uh, leave to administer interrogatories on the opposing party. Now, interrogatories take the form of questions uh, that can be posed um, to the opposing party and uh, require that opposing party to provide its answers on affidavit. Now, interrogatories are a little form of discovery that is used in this jurisdiction. In fact, the reported cases show that it's only ever been used twice. Uh, in a judicial review. One of the cases is the one that is cited in the slides, uh, the Malaysian Association of uh, Private Colleges and Universities case. Uh, there, the High Court set out a, a threefold test that ought to be met in uh, deciding whether or not interrogatories could be administered to an opposing party. Uh, it would be allowed where uh, it, it uh, leads to the fair disposal of matter. 
it reduces the issues at the hearing, shortens the length of the hearing, and reduces costs. So in the uh, Malaysian Association case, interrogatories were allowed to be administered on a private company that was involved in the processing of student visa applications uh, that arose from a governmental circular that was the subject of the challenge in the judicial review. And the High Court there said that the interrogatories related to a material issue in the case uh, that was unclarified from the affidavits and it was a disputed issue in the case. And because of that, the High Court allowed these interrogatories to be administered because it would assist the court in clarifying that important disputed issue. And because of that, the interrogatories uh, was allowed. Now, the final form of uh, discovery that is available is what I mentioned before, cross-examination. Rule 6 allows for this. Uh, the Court of Appeal in the Surahanja, Kulehan Raya, and Karajan Nagri Salango case uh, set out the three um, elements that have to be considered in deciding whether or not cross-examination could be allowed in a judicial review. Uh, that case was a judicial review challenge against uh, the redelineation of electoral boundaries. And I think in that case, the uh, application to cross-examine the deponent was uh, filed against uh, the then commissioner of the election commission. Uh, but the Court of Appeal refused that application. Uh, and in doing so, it set out the three uh, elements that ought to be considered. Now, these three elements are based from uh, on the applicable test in other civil cases. Order 38, I think, uh, allows a party uh, the opportunity to apply to cross-examine uh, a deponent of any affidavit filed in any civil proceedings. And uh, the test that applies there under Order 33 applies likewise here under Order 53 Rule 6, and it's on the slides. So in making an application uh, for leave to cross-examine uh, cross a, a deponent, the applicant would have to show that he intends to challenge the truth of what is deposed on affidavit. And the disputed fact uh, must be relevant to the issue that has to be decided in the judicial review as a whole. But the Court of Appeal also said cross-examination would be refused where there is already enough evidence of contemporaneous documents before the court to enable it to decide on the matter without the need to cross-examine uh, the uh, for uh, the deponent to be allowed to be cross-examined. So you can see that the test is fairly high. It, it's, fairly, it's a fairly stringent approach that the courts take insofar as cross-examination applications are concerned. As I mentioned before, it's only been allowed on two occasions, as far as I can see, uh, insofar as the reported uh, decisions are concerned. Uh, and I think the rationale for that is this. The courts in a judicial review uh, often perform or, or always perform a supervisory function. And uh, facts are not often of relevant dispute in a judicial review. Uh, and the uh, judges often leave the resolution of disputed facts to the decision maker from whom the decision uh, that is the subject of a challenge arose. And cross-examination by its nature relates purely to issues of fact. And uh, therefore, the cross-examination of a deponent, the courts often look upon it as being sometimes unnecessary. There's already affidavit evidence before the court to, to make a decision on the judicial review at hand. And so that is why I think this stringent approach has been adopted insofar as uh, leave to cross-examination, a uh, cross-examine a deponent is concerned. Now, the next part is on amendments. Rule 7 governs the amendments to of pleadings in a judicial review. Uh, the case law shows that amendments can be made to the application for judicial review as well as the Order 53 statement, uh, but not affidavits, uh, because just like in any other civil case, when one seeks to amend something stated on the affidavit um, or clarify something stated, uh, that would be done by way of a corrective affidavit and not by way of a Rule 7 application to amend uh, the affidavit. Now, there are no local cases that have a set up the test that applies uh, in amendments to pleadings in a judicial review, uh, but I would suggest that the applicable test in other civil cases um, would apply likewise in a judicial review. And so this, are, this is the uh, three or four fold test that has arisen from the uh, Yamaha Moto case and the Hong Nong equipment case that of showing the court that your amendment is a bona fide amendment. Uh, it doesn't change the character of the suit uh, and it doesn't prejudice the opposing party in a way that cannot be compensated in costs or, or, and where the amendment is made 
a, a delayed stage in the proceedings, you'd have to justify that delay. So I think that those uh, elements, that test that applies in other civil cases would likewise apply in a judicial review. I say that because of uh, after looking at the cases on amendments uh, in judicial review, uh, it seems to be based, although the, the label is different, it seems to be based broadly on the test that applies. So for instance, in the in other civil cases, so for instance, in the Abdul Hakim Zuka case, uh, an amendment there was refused because it sought, the applicant that sought to enlarge the relief that was originally sought. Now that is akin to a refusal of an amendment on the grounds that it changes the character, the proposed amendment changes the character of the suit. And so that is why I say the applicable test in other civil cases uh, may well likewise apply in a judicial review. Now, next is on the intervention of parties. I spoke about this briefly earlier. Now, um, Rule 8 provides for the intervention of a third party, a non-party uh, in a judicial review. Um, and the test for intervention is what is known as the proper person test. Uh, the applicant who seeks to intervene, uh, the third party that seeks to intervene, uh, must convince the court uh, that uh, it has a direct interest in the case and would be adversely affected by the decision in the judicial review. So for instance, the, in the advanced synergy capital case that I spoke about earlier, the private uh, party, private company, who was a third party to the action, uh, convinced the court that it was a proper person that had a direct interest in the challenge against the Minister of Finance's approval of, an, of a transaction that involved that private company. And so that, that was why the uh, party there was allowed to intervene under the proper person test. Um, the cases have shown that a number of factors are often considered in deciding whether one can intervene, a third party can intervene in a judicial review. I've set out two examples there. Uh, one is where the third party can show um, uh, itself to have a legal or commercial interest in the judicial review that would be affected uh, by the judicial review challenge. So in the Tan Boon Teet case, that was a case that involved uh, the Linus plant that we sometimes read about in the papers that is up in Kwantan. Uh, there, the uh, party that was allowed to intervene was the uh, company that held the temporary operating license to operate that plant. Uh, and uh, it convinced the Court of Appeal that its um, uh, commercial and legal interests were affected by this, or would be affected by the judicial review challenge against the grant of that temporary operating license. And on that ground, the Court of Appeal allowed uh, that company to intervene. Another example is where the third party can show itself to have somehow or rather been involved in the decision-making process of the decision under challenge in the judicial review. So in the Dr. Zulkaini case, their uh, mass rapid transit, MRT, was allowed to intervene in a judicial review challenge against the acquisition of lands for the MRT project. I think the land that was acquired there was the was where the Ampong Point station is meant to be. So MRT was actually involved in the decision making that resulted in the acquisition of those lands. Uh, it prepared the plans, it, it identified uh, which part of the land was to be acquired. And because of that, the court said that MRT is a relevant party that has a direct interest in this judicial review challenge against the acquisition of the land. And because of that, MRT was allowed to intervene. Uh, under Rule 8. But uh, just bear in mind that there are a number of factors. I've only uh, set out two here. It's a, it's a very fact sensitive inquiry that the court would have to make in deciding whether a party has a direct interest or would be adversely affected by the judicial review. OK, so the next part will be on uh, the grounds of challenge. Now, this is a central part in uh, a judicial review act application, the grounds of challenge. Now, the grounds of challenge are really the basis on which the reasons for why the applicant says that the impugned decision was wrong. Now, in, in Malaysia, the courts uh, initially adopted a fairly restrained approach uh, to judicial review uh, applications and only really inquired into the uh, decision making process and not the decision making uh, and not the decision in itself. However, uh, case law developed a little later on in the 1980s and after that, uh, to uh, such that the local courts embraced the Diplockian heads of challenge as set out by Lord Diplock in the Council of Civil Service Unions case, what I mentioned before, 
illegality, irrationality, procedural impropriety, and proportionality. The scope of challenge under these heads of challenge can at times be very extensive because it allows the courts to examine a decision of a public authority not only on its process, not only insofar as the way in which that decision came about, but also uh, on its substance and the merits of that decision. Now, that was accepted by the federal court uh, in the landmark case of Ramachandran, where the federal court said, uh, the court said at the bottom, uh, Lord Diplock's other grounds for impugning a decision susceptible to judicial review make it abundantly clear that such a decision is also open to challenge on grounds of illegality and ir irrationality and in practice, this permits the court, courts to scrutinize such decisions, not only for process, but also for uh, also uh, the substance. And so there you can see there's been an expansion of the scope of uh, challenge in a judicial review uh, as a result of our courts uh, embracing the deblocking heads of challenge under, civil, uh, under the uh, CCSU test case. So I'll speak about each of these uh, four grounds in a bit more detail. First is on illegality. Um, now, illegality relates to uh, uh, substantive ultravirus. Uh, um, and this is ultravirus that goes to the substance of the decision. Now, when, when one speaks of ultravirus, they are essentially saying uh, this. Um, ultravirus conduct uh, relates to uh, 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 arises where a public body acts in excess of its powers or abuses its powers by acting in bad faith or for an improper purpose, or considers an irrelevant matter in making its decision, or fails to uh, consider a relevant matter in making its decision. But in a nutshell, when one speaks about illegality, they are essentially referring to conduct of public bodies uh, that uh, uh, act in excess of its powers. That's in, in a nutshell what illegality uh, refers to. Now, the next slide sets out some examples of uh, illegality and how that principle has been applied by our courts. Uh, one example of illegality is where there's been a breach of uh, legislative provisions. So where a decision is made in breach of an express uh, provision under statute, um, that could be a decision that uh, could be challenged on grounds of illegality. So in the Positive Vision Love One Limited case, which is I think a case that uh, Mr. Mr. Suda was involved in, uh, there, the subject uh, uh, matter decision was a decision of the Director General of Inland Revenue um, that uh, ruled that the applicant was not entitled to a tax exemption under a taxing statute. And the Director General's decision was premised on an administrative policy. And the Federal Court held that that decision of the Director General um, uh, that was premised on policy could not override the express provisions under the taxing statute. And the Director General had in fact acted in breach of the express provisions under the statute by founding his decision on an inferior administrative policy. And the Director General uh, was therefore held to have acted in excess of uh, its jurisdiction. And that decision was struck down on grounds of illegality. Now, another example is what is mentioned in the third bullet point, uh, misapplication of law, conduct that arises from uh, misapplication of a legal principle or a legislative principle uh, is amenable to challenge on grounds of illegality. So in the Sri Ganesan case, uh, there an industrial court award was struck down after the High Court held that the uh, industrial court had not applied the trite rule that parties uh, to a proceeding to proceedings in the industrial court are bound by their pleadings. Uh, that rule wasn't applied and that was held to be a misapplication of the applicable uh, law and, and, and rules, and uh, that industrial court award was struck down on grounds of illegality. Uh, another example, a fairly common one, is uh, where there's been a failure to follow prescribed procedure. Now, uh, oftentimes, a prescribed uh, uh, format or prescribed procedure is set out in a statute uh, insofar as how a decision is to be arrived at, and a failure to follow that prescribed procedure could result in the resultant decision uh, being struck down on grounds of illegality. So in the Lo Hong Tan case, that was a case where the district council had revoked a uh, um, operating license, a business license for a, a particular shop. And uh, the Rent Control Act, which was the applicable legislative uh, provision, uh, uh, legislation said that before 
any operating licenses can be revoked, there had to be a closing order issued by the district council in order to say that this particular shop has to close. But that wasn't followed here. The district council immediately straight away bypassed the closing order procedure and, issue, and revoked the license. And that decision was struck down uh, for failure to follow the prescribed procedure under the Rent Control Act uh, on grounds of illegality. So those are just some broad examples of where illegality uh, would apply. The next ground of challenge is irrationality. Now, uh, this um, uh, ground of challenge, although it was cited by Lord Diplock in the Civil Service Union's case, it really arose from the landmark Court of Appeal, English Court of Appeal decision of Associated uh, Provincial Picture Houses and Wednesday Corporation, a judgment of the uh, then Master of the Rolls, Lord Green, uh, who devised the term uh, in the judicial review context of ir irrationality and unreasonableness. Um, the definition is set out in the quotes that you see on the screen, but essentially unreasonableness and irrationality in the public law context relates to decisions that arise from a flawed decision-making process or decisions that can be said to be uh, absurd, incomprehensible uh, or perverse. Now, this invites a very fact and um, circumstance-based inquiry. And that is why a reference to examples uh, as to how these principles apply uh, would be helpful. But before I get to those examples, I'd just like to say that we would expect uh, the concept of unreasonableness to be a very fluid concept. And in appreciation of that, the law has held that uh, unreasonableness needs to be uh, assessed against an objective test. What does that mean? That means the question that the court has to ask is whether a reasonable person would consider the impugned decision to be irrational or unreasonable. I've set out some examples there. The first one, the, under the second bullet point, decision contrary to common sense. The appellant there may be fairly familiar to many in the audience. There was a, uh, uh, that was a judicial review challenge against the then Home Minister's ban of a society on grounds that the Home Minister said that that particular society uh, posed a threat to national security. The Court of Appeal struck down that decision of the Home Minister after finding that there was no evidence that the society proposed posed a threat to uh, society at large. And the Court of Appeal actually expressly said that the decision of the Home Minister was contrary to common sense. And uh, that decision was struck down on grounds of uh, unreasonableness. Another very common example of where the unreasonableness or irrationality principle is applied is where it can be said that the decision of the public body was not supported by any facts or evidence. So in the Supreme Court case of Harper's Trading, which was a judicial review challenge against an industrial court award, uh, there the Supreme Court upheld the industrial court award after accepting that the chairman of the industrial court came to its conclusions based on the evidence of weaknesses that had been tendered at the trial. And because of that, on grounds on the uh, unreasonableness and irrationality principle, uh, that decision was actually upheld. Uh, because it was supported by facts and uh, evidence. Uh, another example of unreasonableness could arise where there has been a departure from uh, um, applicable policies or practices or precedents within the public body. Um, sometimes reasonableness uh, can be determined against such uh, uh, benchmarks, policies, practices and, pre uh, and precedents within the public uh, uh, body. And so any departure from these benchmarks could result in a finding that that decision was unreasonable. So that was seen in the Tego at Hong case, where a, uh, a student uh, applied to challenge the uh, education ministry's uh, um, uh, refusal or rejection of his application uh, to be exempted from paying his student loan. And uh, the Court of Appeal uh, struck down that decision of the education ministry uh, that rejected his application to be exempted from pay, repaying his student loan because it held that the ministry did not follow the prescribed uh, criteria that should be assessed in deciding whether a student can be exempted from repaying his student loan. And so that was seen to be a unreasonable departure from the applicable policy and the practices of the uh, um, department, education department. And that decision was struck down on grounds of unreasonableness. 
The third uh, ground of challenge is uh, procedural uh, impropriety. Now, this calls for a review of whether the prescribed procedure uh, of the public body was followed or whether generally the procedure that was adopted ensured fairness in the uh, process. The federal court in the Malaysian airline system case uh, tabulated the uh, uh, instances when procedural impropriety can occur. It's set on the slide. So where there's been a failure to observe basic rules of natural justice, uh, where there's been a failure to act with procedural fairness toward the person who will be affected by the decision, or where there's been a failure to observe procedural rules uh, that have been set out expressly in the statute. Those are instances when procedural impropriety can arise. Now, it will be seen that under this ground of challenge, uh, it, it really invites a review, not so much on the merits of the decision, but rather the court will be more focused on the manner in which that, that decision came about. The court will look uh, at whether the proper procedure was followed. So there are some examples, these are some examples of where uh, procedural impropriety, uh, that ground would apply. One very common one in judicial review cases is where there has been a denial of, uh, of a right to be heard. Um, generally, the general rule is this, that whenever a person's rights are deprived, are to be deprived or to be curtailed in any way, uh, that person ought to be given a chance to defend himself, to, to be heard prior to the uh, making of that decision. Uh, and, and the cases have accepted that the right to be heard need not come in the form of an oral hearing. It could be by way of an exchange of letters. So in the uh, context of employment law, uh, where a show cause is, is issued to an employee um, um, uh, prior to a decision being made, and that employee responds to that show cause, that is evidence of the employee's exercising of his right to be heard uh, prior to the decision uh, made by the employer. Uh, but just bear in mind that the denial of the right to be heard is a, a fairly common instance where uh, procedural impropriety, that principle may apply. Another uh, instance is where there's been a failure to consult uh, relevant entities. Now, procedural propriety could sometimes require that the public body consult with uh, relevant entities before making a decision. So in the Kasatuan Pergerja Kverja Bukan Executive Maybank uh, case, there the federal court held that the Director General of Trade Unions uh, had a duty to consult with the National Union of Bank Employees prior to deciding on the registration of a trade union in the uh, banking industry. Now, this was because the National Union of Bank Employees uh, was seen as representing the interests of the members of the trade union in question, and therefore was an interested party. And the failure of the Director General to consult with this national union uh, showed that the Director General had not exercised its powers uh, lawfully in the context of procedure. So that is a fairly interesting principle that um, where uh, the courts have kind of foisted upon public bodies the need to uh, consult with relevant persons, relevant uh, 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 persons who have an interest in the matter prior to making a decision. Uh, and so this is a fairly recent case, 2017. Uh, it will be interesting to see how the courts after this um, uh, particular ruling develop this principle because it is a very well established principle in the UK, uh, not so much here at the moment. But hopefully, uh, after this decision of uh, the federal court, uh, this becomes a well entrenched principle because it is a very important uh, principle, I think, uh, because public bodies often have very wide powers that affect a wide cross section of society. And so it would be good if they were to uh, be required to consult the interested persons before they make such consequential decisions. But just moving on. Uh, the, another a very common instance where procedural impropriety, the principle applies, is where there's been a failure to give reasons. Now, uh, the failure to give reasons is often seen as one of the hallmarks of a transparent government. Uh, it promotes accountability in the public sector, because what better way to identify why a decision was made by being told the reasons for the decision. Uh, and so in the Kalab uh, Lambakuda Perak case, the Minister of Human Resources there was held to have acted improperly by failing to give reasons uh, in his decision to adopt a recommendation of the Director General of Trade Unions in recognizing a, a trade union, and that was held to be uh, unlawful on grounds of procedural impropriety. Now, the final ground of 
challenge in a judicial review uh, is the uh, ground on, of, of proportionality. Now, uh, under the proportionality principle, uh, this invites a review of whether the state action uh, was proportionate to the gravity or seriousness of the alleged wrong. It is, in essence, a review to see if the executive's response to a particular matter was commensurate to the breach, proportionate to the breach. Now, just to give a contemporary example of how this principle has uh, applied, uh, last year, at the height of the uh, COVID crisis, which we are still in, um, in around uh, April or May in the UK, there was a quite a wide lobby who were against the government's decision to lock the entire citizenry, to lock the entire population down, irrespective of age. Now, that lobby took the view that really the, it was only the elderly, people above 65, uh, who were affected uh, by, uh, seriously affected by the pandemic, not so much the uh, younger part of the population. And so the government's decision to lock the entire uh, public in, irrespective of age, was argued to be a disproportionate act. And one of the proponents of this lobby is a well, was a well-known uh, judge of the Supreme Court, Lord Sumption, who in essence uh, relied upon this proportionality principle to argue against that uh, governmental position. He essentially said that locking in the entire public uh, because of this crisis was disproportionate and unduly curtailed the uh, rights to uh, uh, liberty of the public. And so that was that is a contemporary example of how the proportionality principle could apply uh, uh, in the contemporary dynamics of, of society. Now, the uh, there are some cases that have set out the things that ought to be looked at uh, in deciding whether proportionality applies, and they are set out in the second bullet point there, arises from the De Freitas case. This was accepted by our federal court in the Pacific World Destination uh, case, uh, whether it is, requires an assessment of whether the objective, the executive's ob objective, is sufficiently important to justify limiting a person's rights, whether the measures designed to meet the objective of the executive are rationally connected to the deprivation of the rights, whether the means used to impair the right are no more that is necessary to accomplish the objective. Now, the uh, proportionality principle, insofar as our uh, jurisprudence is concerned, is often applied in the context of assessing punishment or the pen penalty imposed. So in the uh, Tan Tek Seng uh, case, uh, there the Court of Appeal held that the decision, that, that the dismissal of a public school teacher was unduly excessive uh, as a result of the misconduct of that uh, teacher. The Court of Appeal essentially said that you didn't have to dismiss this particular teacher. You could have maybe warned her or given some other form of lesser punishment and not act in such a drastic manner as to dismiss the teacher. And so that is where the proportionality principle often applies in our jurisdiction in the context of deciding whether a penalty or a punishment, punishment uh, was excessive or, or, or otherwise. Now, come to the final section of the talk on remedies. Um, as I mentioned in the first part, the Judicial Review Court uh, is equipped with fairly wide uh, powers uh, insofar as the grant of relief and remedies to a successful uh, applicant uh, is concerned. I've set out the, the more common forms of relief uh, in the following slides. The first one is a declaratory order. This is a very common form of relief. And it essentially takes the form of a proclamation or a statement of the legal position of a party or a matter. Uh, and it often precedes the grant of a prerogative order. Prerogative order, when I say prerogative order, I mean social or I, uh, mandamus. I'll speak about those orders a little later on. But a declaration often precedes the grant of such orders. So for instance, when one seeks to challenge uh, an industrial court, oftentimes uh, that application would first ask for a declaration that the industrial court award was, is, for example, industrial court award uh, is infected by illegality as being made in breach of a particular provision. Uh, that will be the first uh, request or prayer. And the second request would be an order of shil right to strike down, or to quash that industrial court award. Um, it brings me to the next uh, form of relief, which is an order of shil right That is essentially an order to quash 
or to uh, strike down a decision of a public body. Now, uh, because of this very wide consequence that a uh, social right order has, essentially striking down a decision of the government, um, courts don't uh, grant this uh, form of relief uh, lightly. Uh, some cases have accepted that the applicant would have to show substantial injustice to have arisen prior to the grant of an order of social right. So for instance, in the Nu To Tong case, that was a judicial review challenge against uh, uh, an award of compensation for the acquisition of lands. The applicant was unhappy with the award of compensation, the amount of compensation that he was uh, given for his lands being acquired. Now, even though the Court of Appeal accepted that there was an impropriety, there was an unlawfulness, in the award of the compensation, it refused to uh, grant the order of social RI because what actually happened was that the compensation that was awarded was actually 20 times more than what the applicant would have otherwise obtained. And so the Court of Appeal actually accepted that there was an absence of injustice, let alone substantial injustice uh, in the decision that was under challenge. And that was, uh, it was on those grounds that uh, social RI was uh, refused in that case. Now, the other common form of relief in a judicial review is an order of mandamus. This is essentially a, uh, a command issued by the court to a public authority to perform a public duty that uh, has been placed upon that particular public uh, authority. So in the Petro Jasa case, the case cited in the first bullet point, uh, there an order of mandamus was granted to enforce a certificate under section 33 of the Government Proceeding Act that required monies to be paid by the state government of Sabah uh, to this private entity. And so it was essentially a, an order to enforce what was uh, stated in a certificate, an order that required the public body to perform a particular act. The case of Pritam Singh uh, set out uh, the four requirements for a writ of mandamus to be issued. Number one, whether the applicant has a clear and specific legal right to the relief that was sought. Number two is very important whether there is a duty imposed on law, on the respondent, on the public body. So essentially an order of mandamus really is a, an order to require a public body to perform a particular act that it was already required to perform. So the applicant would have to show either there was a court order that required this public authority to do something and he has failed to act in, a, in, a, in pursuance of that court order. The applicant would have to appoint, point to that court order and say that, look, you have to act pursuant to this particular order. Or alternatively, where there is a particular uh, legislative provision that requires the public body to act in a particular way, that legislative provision will provide the foundation for the request or for the application for mandamus. You have to show that there was already a duty that applied to this public body to act, for it to act in the way that uh, you wanted to act. Uh, the third uh, uh, element is whether such a duty of, whether such a duty of an imper imperative ministerial character and or no judgment or discretion on the part of the respondent. Essentially, where there is an element of discretion uh, on the part of the public authority, uh, that may reduce the chances of obtaining an order of mandamus. Where the public authority actually has a decision whether he wants to act in a particular way, the court may not uh, interfere and grant an order of mandamus. It has to be a very clear duty that the uh, uh, public body has to uh, follow in order for an order of mandamus to issue. Fourthly, whether the applicant has any remedy other than by way of an order of mandamus to enforce the, the right which has been denied to him. This is an alternative remedy because an order of mandamus, much like an order of certiorari, is of wide consequence. Essentially, the court is telling the government to act in a particular way because it is of, of a very wide consequence. If there is some other way the applicant can get his relief, and that could limit the applicant's chances to obtaining a, uh, an order of mandamus. The next form of relief is an order of prohibition, uh, which restrains a public body from making a decision or embarking upon a particular course that is held to be unlawful. Uh, a, a, an order of prohibition, a written prohibition, prevents a public uh, body from acting in an unlaw un unlawful ma uh, manner. Uh, an example of this in the industrial uh, relations context is where a writ of uh, prohibition uh, uh, can be issued to prevent uh, the industrial court from adjudicating upon a claim that was filed out of time. 
So it's essentially an order, much like an injunction, fairly uh, similar, uh, that prevents a public body from acting in an unlawful way. Uh, the next form of relief that is on the slides is uh, the writ of power rental, very much little used in this jurisdiction, but of exceptionally wide consequence. A writ of power warranto, if it is ordered, uh, unseats a person from public office. So where the applicant takes the position that a particular person is unqualified to assume a particular public office, the relief that that applicant would seek is a writ of power warranto. Uh, it is very much little used in this jurisdiction. It has been used in the past where an application was filed to uh, 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 unseat an industrial court chairman from that office on the grounds that that, per that person was unqualified to assume that office. And so in that case, a writ of power until was, was granted, but it's very little used in this jurisdiction, I suspect, because of the exceptionally wide consequence that it has on um, the person to assume public office. The, uh, another form of relief is uh, a grant of an injunction. I spoke about this at the uh, first part of the slides. Uh, rule 2.3 allows for injunctions to be granted, uh, but it has to be uh, uh, made within the confines of the uh, Government Proceedings Act. Um, the other form of injunction is rule five, uh, sorry, the other form of relief is uh, damages. Under Rule 5, uh, Rule 5 says that an applicant is entitled to damages in a judicial review. Now, on this score, uh, uh, a wrong that sounds in damages in judicial review must reflect a, uh, um, a wrong done in tort or contract. What this means is that uh, the, what the applicant would be awarded in tort or contract, he would be awarded in, uh, in damages in judicial review. And so uh, what the applicant has to do is that the applicant would be re required to identify an equivalent claim in tort or contract uh, as his claim in a judicial review. So for instance, where the applicant complains that his uh, or her reputation has been damaged as a result of a decision of a public body, um, and that complaint is in a judicial review, uh, the equivalent claim for that applicant is a claim uh, under the tort of defamation. And so the damages that would arise in the event the applicant is successful in the judicial review challenge would be damages uh, that he could get as a result of a successful claim for defamation. So that is how the principles in damages in judicial review works. You need to peg your, your claim uh, against a, uh, an equivalent claim in either tort or contract in order to be entitled to damages in judicial review. I think that brings me to the end of uh, the talk.